This week's episode is sponsored by Change. Change is the number one mentoring program that teaches you e-commerce from scratch. Change has a real community with real results. I have been working with Ryan for many years now and have attended many of his events and retreats across the world and got to meet members and the amazing community of like-minded people. Ryan works with a lot of big names in the business world, helping them build online businesses and e-commerce. Change offers personal one-on-one support, no experience needed, but like anything, this takes time and is not a get-rich-quick scheme. If you put the work in, you will get the results. E-commerce and online shopping is getting bigger and bigger. This is a great opportunity for anyone that is looking for financial freedom. For more information, go follow Ryan on Instagram at RyanJB and he will guide you through the steps to help you get started and build a successful online business. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you are notified for when my next podcast goes live. And boom, we're on. Okay. And today's guest, we've got Dr. Ney. How are you, Nadine? I'm good. How are you? Really well, thank you. You've got a book out. You're known for being married to Jordan Belfort. Correct. For Wall Street. Ma- mega film. I love the film myself, if I'm honest. Yeah. Um, but now you've got a PhD. Um, you're working with people, trauma bonding, relationship advice, because you went through a turmoil relationship yourself, very toxic, very abusive. Yes. And now you've come out the other end. Now you're happily married. 20, yeah. what, six years, 24 years? 24 years, years something like that, yeah. That's a long time. It is a long time. We'll plug your book straight away. What's your book called? It's called Run Like Hell. It's a good name. <laughs> and just a little info about that book. What's that about? So it's called Run Like Hell, A Therapist's Guide to Recognizing, Escaping, and Healing from Trauma Bonds. So it's about trauma bonds, what they are, who the people are in the trauma bond, the pathological person, the woman that usually falls victim to them, the symptoms that you get from being in a trauma bond, and most importantly, how to heal, because healing is possible. Yeah, and that's the beauty of anything. Anyone can heal. Anyone can change as well. A lot of people say not, but if you genuinely, truly want to work within and go deep-rooted trauma and pain, it's possible. It is possible, yes. Before we get into everything, though, I always like to go back to the start with my guests, get more of a bit of an understanding about you, Nadine, where you grew up and how it all began. Yeah, so I grew up in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, hence the Duchess of Bay Ridge, right? That's why he called me that. And I was raised by a single mother, and it was a great time to be young in Brooklyn in the 70s, right? No internet, no phones, just playing on the street. And I was very blessed. My mother was very into psychology, and very into Carl Jung and Sigmund Freud and feelings. And so I had a pretty charmed childhood, very drama free. And then, but I did grow up with a single mother, so I needed to make money. And so I became a model, I think around 19, 20 years old, because I needed to make money to live. And as the movie, The Wolf of Wall Street shows, I went to a party that changed my life forever. And I met my ex-husband, Jordan Belfort, at that party. What were you like at school? I was always, I loved school. I'm a nerd. (laughs) Sitting at the front of the class. I was a total, how'd you know that? Yeah, I'm a good reader of people also. (laughs) I was. my job. I was a good, I loved school. I was a goody two shoes, yeah. Yeah. Was that not to let, were you close to your mum? Very close. Is that why you didn't want to let her down? So you tried as much as yeah, you could? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, and I love to learn, hence why I got my doctorate. I think it's just also in my innate nature. Mm-hmm. I get, I don't know, I get high from learning. What was your relationships like before Jordan? My romantic Relas- relationships? Yeah. Oh, they were typical of a young girl, you know, just falling in love at the drop of a hat. <laughs> um, Did you crave that father figure? Did I? Well, my dad was in and out of my life. 
I don't know that I craved a father figure, but I love being in love. I love uh, loving other people. I'm a very relational person. That's why I'm a therapist. But And, you know, I was fed all those myths from Disney and someday your prince is going to yeah. come and save you. All the bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it went all the shit. All the bullshit. Yeah. Exactly. What is love? Because <clears throat> obviously when you're young, it's called puppy love. But what is love? Because we can love people, but if we love them, then why don't we make changes to be better? Why don't we stay with them and work at it? Like... There's so many different aspects you yes. can look at love. What is love? So for me, it's about the quality of connection that you have with someone, and it's a real emotional bond that gets created through deep respect, trust, and care. But there's also a second piece of love that I talk about that I don't think a lot of people recognize. It's also the ability to give the person that you love the space to be authentically who they are and not want to dominate them or control them. Love them with all their imperfections and flaws. Yeah, because it's easy to love people for the good points, but it's- Of course. The hard part is accepting the bad. Or accepting the things that maybe aren't exactly like you, right? Or that maybe trigger you a little bit. Everyone is different, especially male and female. We are different, we do see the world different. Why do you think male and female are clashing so much now with masculinity and Femininity always getting spoke about. Um, I think there's a lot of things in the political milieu that are fostering that too. I, and I, I just think we are very different, and we're not really taught to accept and appreciate differences in people. I mean, how boring would the world be if we were all the same, yeah. right? And so, you, you know, we all can embody masculine and ener- um, feminine features. I know that as I've gotten older, I was much more feminine when I was younger, and now I've integrated a lot more of my masculine being more aggressive and owning my power. So, And then I noticed my husband, he's become a lot more feminine and embracing his feelings and vulnerability. The roles have switched. The roles have switched, yeah. Do you feel that easier, though, because of the toxic relationship and being not controlled? But you are controlled to a degree as well. You're manipulated, but... Do you feel it easier that you're in control because you know you'll not have the same feelings and emotions that you had with the previous marriage? Yeah, what I find, and this is also another important piece about love, so I'm glad you brought this up, is that I'm in my power, which power simply means the ability to influence myself, right? That's what it means to be empowered. So I'm in my power, my husband's in his power, but we're not over each other. We're equals. And I don't. that's why I wrote my book, because... In a trauma bond, there is a power imbalance. One person has the power and abuses it. So I hope for a world where we can all kind of embrace that way of being. The divorce rates through the roof. Oh, yes. Yes. But that's, I think, also because we don't teach people how to do relationships in school. Reading, writing, arithmetic. Who gives a shit about that? No, I mean, you need that. But you need to know how to have relationships they're the foundation of our life. They're the foundation of society. I had to go to school to learn, and nobody teaches us how to do it. Mm-hmm. And also, we're living longer, right? So you, you know, somebody that made sense to you at twenty-two might not make sense to you at fifty-two. Yeah. So the night, the day you met Jordan, it was at a party. It was at a party. How true as how what percentage of the movie is legit? Oh, ninety percent. Yeah, because I know he had to cut a lot of shit out, is that correct? I think they did, yeah. I think it was even more over the top than what it showed. Yeah, I do. Mm -hmm. So you went to the party with your boyfriend or just a date? I went to my party, to that party with my boyfriend. And just like the movie shows, like someone exposed themselves to me. And I was totally freaked out. And I said to him, we got to get out of here. These people are nuts. No, I didn't know they were all on Quaaludes at the time. Because I was 22. I didn't even know what a Quaalude was. And we left. But then I guess Jordan had set his sights on me and decided he wanted to date me. What is that if someone, if you fancy a woman or like someone, you do whatever you can to get? Is it, because where is the fucking fine line? You totally talk about love bombing. Yeah. If someone likes to treat a woman good as well, yes. it's surely better than being the opposite. Correct. Obviously, women are, men are manipulators, mass manipulators, but so are women. Both uh-huh. are vulnerable. I yes. believe men are vulnerable than women. Yeah. That's my own opinion from being a man. I believe men are more sensitive. I believe women are the stronger species. I believe 
Yeah. The, the universe revolves around women. Yeah. But we need masculine energy to build up the world, never fucking bend or break, which is important. But how is that then when someone is love bombing? And it, because it's all sexy. It doesn't matter who you are. If you've got a man with confidence, drives a nice car, has a nice watch, and is, is, you just sense a presence. Yes. And if he's been bothering you with jewellery, <laughs> flowers, chocolates, oh, yeah. any girl, majority of girls might disagree because they've never experienced that. Yes. But if you feel that or see that, is it, do you, did you just feel automatically attracted and gravitated towards it, even though you knew it was wrong? Oh, I didn't know it was wrong back then. Mm -hmm. I thought it was fantastic. Oh my God, it was amazing. I mean, I totally got swept off my feet. We fell madly, madly in love. And it was glamorous and exciting. I didn't, nobody talked about love bombing all those years ago. So I didn't know that it was, I didn't know that it was more of a manipulative tactic to kind of really make sure I got locked in. I just was like, oh, he loves me so much. And that could have been a piece of it too. But now in retrospect, I, I say this very simply, if it feels too good to be true, it probably is. But do you think he knew what he was doing or was that just his character of trying to show off and pride and ego goes into play where you're trying yeah, to Yeah, I think that's who he is. I think that's who he is. I or think that's how he shows up. Should have been love. a tactic of yeah. knowing, it, knowing that people do fall for that sort yes, of Yes, I think patterns. it's both. I think it's both because he's incredibly bright. I don't know if back then it was such a tactic, but that is who he is. Big, grandiose, in charge. Very dominant, very aggressive, yes. So how did you meet then? Because he was married, you had a boyfriend. How did it all yes. come about? Yes, so then what happens is um, he paid, he he told a woman who I wasn't even really that great friends with to get me to go out to dinner with her and that he would just show up and he made her $15,000 in the stock market. <laughs> so he gave her fifteen grand for you to set up the date? Yes, and I had no idea that I was getting set up on a date. I just showed up like, hello. What was it like walking into that party? What was the the house like and the cars? The and... house, you know, the house was a big white house on the beach in the Hamptons. It wasn't too crazy back then. It was contemporary, so it was very sparse. Yeah, he had a big white Testarossa, I think, in, in, with a special muffler in the uh, driveway. So who was it who pulled that pecker out? Oh, some, some broker. To you? Yeah. I forgot who it was. Was it Mark Hanna? I forgot exactly who it was. But I was just like, this is really, you know, as a young girl, it makes you feel really uncomfortable. You know, it really made me feel scared initially. So that happened? Yes, that happened. And how long did it take for you to see him again after that when you left the party? Um, Let's think about this. Probably six months later. So it wasn't a couple of days later? No, no. I mean, I would see him around the Hamptons. Um, but I would say six months later, cause I went to Chicago to model and then I came back and we worked out at the same gym and he said to me, I'm separated. I have an apartment in the city. Let's go out to dinner. And then we went out to dinner and the rest, as they say, is history. How long did it take for you to fall in love with him? Uh, two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> so you're just as fucked up as him then. <laughs> I was totally enamored with him. Yeah. No, we got engaged six months later and got married six months later. And what happened with his wife and stuff? So he ended up leaving his wife, and that was very, very painful, I'm sure, for her and even for him. Um, yeah, but I guess he was he was he had fallen out of love with her, as he explained it to me. And they didn't have children, so it was a pretty seamless, easy divorce. And we got married. And how were you with him every day back then? Because obviously the movies are traveling, hookers, partying. Was I with him every day initially when we met? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was with him all the time. Is that a red flag? Because men, including myself, I become obsessed as well. Yeah. But I don't know if that's majority of men. If, if people are honest, we do. But it's like men are controlling naturally, I think. If you're leaders. Naturally. Men, okay, yeah. yeah. And I just feel when people meet, like I'm the I'm the same. I just want that person there. I want to spoil them. Like I've probably got all the same fucking traits <laughs> as him. I maybe edit that out just in case. But is uh, I've pro I've probably got the same traits. Yeah. And men, majority of men probably have. Is that standard in a relationship? Because people say take it easy or whatever. But when you want to be with someone, is it a bad yeah. thing? You want you don't you want to be with them all the time because I... you do suffocate it. We get it. But 
What, yeah. How I do you balance think, it out? Especially when you're younger, you got a lot of hormones involved and it's a lot of physical, sexual feelings racing through you, you know, so I think it's complex. And I I don't think it's healthy to like become obsessed and just be with someone all the time. Because again, if we go back to my definition, you have to give people space, right? Mm -hmm. But we were infatuated and together all the time. And again, I thought this is just what love is. When did the, was it always partying then at the start of the relationship or was it more hidden? It was, it was, there was light partying in the beginning of relationship and then the drug addiction got exacerbated as time went on. And you were 22, how old was he? 28. Still young. Oh like yeah. Two young kids. Yeah, we were young kids, exactly. Was he making good money then at the start? Yes, he was. Was he a big spender? Oh my God. <laughs> There's no words for what a big spender he was. And how much an attraction is that for a female, if we're honest? Because sure. women do gravitate towards that luxurious lifestyle. It doesn't matter who you are. The women can moan and complain and say, oh, I wouldn't go for a man with money. But if he's got it, because any man who's got a business or who's on his feet or doing well, that's an attraction automatically. Yes. For me, yes. Like, it's an element of power. Mm -hmm. Men, from my own experience, and like I said, I don't know everybody, but mm -hmm. men, women, men are the leaders and protectors, I believe. Uh huh. And this, and this, women are nurturers and loving and caring. Yes. When you see a man who's got that sense of power, that money is, is that a, a turn on for a woman? Oh, for me back then, for, for sure. For anyone. Yeah, for me, I can only speak for myself personally. It, it completely was. Yeah, and also he was self-made, right? So he made all the money himself. He's incredibly bright. I looked at his lavishing everybody with money as, at that time as incredibly generous. And yeah, it was fun. But I didn't realize it was a trap. When did you start seeing the telltale signs? You know, I would say it, it happened kind of early. And um, because his personality was a lot of high pressure sales tactics, even in love. So he was like, if you don't... Um, marry me, I'm not going to date you. And I was like, I don't want to get married. I'm tw then at this point, I'm 23. I was modeling. I didn't want to get married till I was 30 because my parents had gotten divorced. So but he was like, if you don't marry me, you know, I'm not going to date you. But then he ups the ante. If you don't um, have kids with me, I'm not going to marry you. So it was always like the goal was getting moved. And there was a lot of dominating high pressure tactics in the beginning, like six months in. And back then, I didn't understand about coercive control and domination and intimidation. And so I was just like, oh, he just loves me so much. That's mm -hmm. what he wants. So it happened about six months in. So he was treating his relationship like a business deal also, do you think? With the pressure and the Yeah, I think and... that's a good way to say it. I had not thought about it through that lens. But yes, I do think that's a good way to describe it. So what's that called then with that nature of moving the goalpost, babies, marriage, yeah, that's called coercive control. So that's somebody pressuring you to do what they want you to do. So he wasn't listening to me. I was like, I love you, but I just don't want to get married yet. I love you. I'm not ready for babies yet. Now, listen, I have two beautiful children. They're my best friends. So I'm so happy I have them. And, but that's called coercive control. And a lover is pressuring you to do what they want you to do instead of respecting like, OK, let's wait a year or two. I wasn't going anywhere. Mm -hmm. I was madly in love. So where's the line between being a protector and provider and controlling that men lead by example to then women being submissive? Where's the, the fine line of respecting your boundaries also, but he's got boundaries. We want to have kids. He's wanting to be married. Yeah. You don't. So where where do you, where does it mean? Is it a case of, okay, we're on a different place of each other, which best stepping back? Or does someone, because someone's got to give. Yeah, I think there's also can be something called compromise. Yeah. You know, like, okay, I hear you, you know, then let's get married and let's wait two years to have kids, right? Or some sort of compromise, but there was none of that was available. It was his way or the highway. But you're partying also? Yes. Did you take the quaaludes? Oh, yeah. What were they like? Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The only thing is I took one. I didn't take 10. I just don't have that addictive personality. Not yeah, on wood. I would have been fucking on 20, 30. <laughs> so what is quaaludes for people who don't know? Yeah. So I guess it's in the sedative category. So 
it it makes you go down, but it also makes you go up. I can't explain it. It's got like, I guess you could, could almost say it's like a Valium or Xanax, but it doesn't knock you out. It still makes you feel a little bit alive. To just it kind of make it's like euphoria. I think it makes you feel euphoric. Yeah. So what was your partying like then? Did your partying enhance while you were with him? Yes. I yeah. I'd never done a Quelo till I met him. Never. But again, I don't have an addictive personality, so it just that wasn't. Thank God I don't. And how was the modeling career? Good. You, hard. Back, very yeah? hard. So you were still working while with him. Yeah, I was still working, but that was another thing. He was like, "You have to quit being a model." Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Yeah, I'm surprised he, he let you. He's, yeah, no, no. And I was like, "But I'm going to make three thousand dollars today." He's like, "That's nothing. You're quitting." I was like, "Okay." He's not understanding of what you want to do. Exactly. Your plan, so. Exactly. But again, you were submissive to a lot of stuff yeah. also. Yeah, yeah. So what do you call that then? So I, so that's what my book is about. So I do a lot of research on the female's personality traits that really are perfect prey or fall for these sorts of relationships. And I have two traits. Uh, one of them is agreeableness, which means I'm very tolerant. I'm very loyal. I'm very empathetic, hence what makes me a good therapist. And I'm highly conscientious means I'm very organized and driven and I will like see things to the end. So even when I was with him, even though all this crazy stuff was going on, I was like, I'm going to figure this out. We're going to work this out. So those personality traits, which are good things, which enabled me to get my doctorate, right, to be conscientious, they're not great with that type of person. They get weaponized. They got weaponized against me. So that's why one of the reasons I wrote my book is to kind of break the stigma and stop labeling these women as help learned helplessness and codependent. That doesn't mean that I was perfect. Trust me. I had plenty, plenty of my own flaws. You know, maybe one, maybe people pleasing or accommodating too much for sure. And I didn't understand who I really was. Um, so I certainly had my own flaws. They just weren't super detrimental to him. Do you think it was harder to leave him because of the lifestyle that he gave you also if it was just an average working man, 95? Yeah. No disrespect to anybody who does that, but yes. shitty car, shitty house, who was just struggling to get by. Do you think it would have been easier to leave that man instead of yes. the job? Yes. I mean, also? I don't know if it would be easier, but I know it was very hard for me because with that sort of money, then I ended up supporting my family. And um, also it was hard to leave him because I feared him. Aggressively? Yeah. Could he have killed you? Oh, I, I don't want to think like that. I hope not. No, but, but you know what I mean? But I mean, when, yeah, power. when he kicked me down the stairs, that was backwards. That could have, you know, killed, hurt my neck pretty badly. And how far into the relationship did that happen? That happened about seven years in. Was there any telltale signs at the start of being abusive? You know, I think that when he ripped the phone out of the wall, that was probably a good sign that it, he could have gotten... There was never any violence per se towards me in, in the beginning, like ripped a phone out of the wall. But his temper, when you're with a person like that, they have um, rage. And I had never really seen rage like that before because I grew up with my mom and she wasn't a big yeller. So I was like, what the hell is this? Mm -hmm. It's different. Yeah, it was what different. is that with men? The rage and anger. So is the, that abandonment issues. No, what does that well, come from? There's, some, there's something called humiliated fury, and it's a mix of entitlement, shame, and anger. I think I've got that. <laughs> I think this is a well, fucking. I think here's... this is a fairy possession for me. I'm the phone unit in and book in a session. <laughs> well, here's the thing. It's good to know yourself. Yeah, I do. Have to, I don't like to shy away from my flaws. I've made a lot of changes and sacrifices to then. Yeah, do better in life, um, yeah. but I'm still a little fucked up. All men are. No matter what I do, I never feel good enough. Oh, so there's that shame. Yeah, or always yeah. the imposter syndrome and all that shit kicks in, but I don't stop either. We're constantly working, constantly hustling. I provide for my family. Don't drink, don't take drugs. I saw life that. Life is amazing, but... Good for you. you. just I just question what the fuck is life, you know? Yeah. What the fuck is it really? <laughs> Why are we sitting here? Why do you do what you do? Why do we do what we do? It's just crazy how that's just me overthinking the full the full process of life. It's yeah. Just, it's a beautiful mess sometimes. Yeah, and that's, you know, like existential thoughts, right? What are we all here for? What is this all about? 
And I go back to the beginning. We're here to connect with people in love. That's what we're here for. I mean, how much do you love your children? Like my children, I could cry talking about them, my grandson, you know, and I don't know. I think that we're we're all here if we can to try to leave a better legacy for the world when we leave it. Because really, then what the fuck is it all about? When did he propose then? How did they propose? Oh, oh, yeah, that's that's my number one post on TikTok and Instagram. It's so funny. He uh, proposed to me in front of my favorite fast food place and she said, hey, rolling roaster. <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, I'm still a Brooklyn girl. But it's mad though. But again, as much as we can slate men and talk about trauma bonding and all the negative traits, like, to, but to do that as well and think about you and your best place and other people might laugh at where it was or whatever, but it was more connected to you. So men are men are good souls as well. We're just a little we're a, we're a little fucked up. Um but again, all the it's hard, but again, there must have been a lot of love there as well. There was, there was. And you know, I want to say something though, and you know, you keep talking about men being fucked up. You know, we haven't taught men that it's okay to feel. We haven't taught men that it's okay to be vulnerable. And I do think that there are a lot of very sensitive men out there that also want to be driven and successful, right? And how do they manage those two pieces? We've got to get better at that with men. Yeah, where does that stem from? Society, what we, you know, societal expectations of what it means to be a man, uh -huh. you know? I mean, I just think, of, I, I, I feel for men in that way. What was the marriage like? What was the, when you get married? You know, it was, it had a lot of things that create a trauma bond, which is something called intermittent abuse or intermittent reinforcement, meaning there was a lot of great times where he was generous and helpful and loving and kind. And there were a lot of horrible times where he was control and controlling and manipulative. And that's actually what creates the bond and a trauma bond, that intermittent abuse. And that's what the marriage was like, an emotional merry-go-round. Like Stockholm Syndrome? Well, Stockholm Syndrome is similar, but Stockholm Syndrome is different because you're attaching to your abuser, but you don't know them. A trauma bond is almost worse because it starts out with promises of hope and tenderness and love. How much did the drugs play a massive effect on this anger and frustration? Yeah. Do you feel as if it would have been that character anyway, or did the drugs just make him a different monster? I think the drugs made him a monster. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think he has a strong, narcissistic, grandiose character anyway, right? But I think then the drugs really took him down. Yeah, because everybody has narcissistic traits. Of course, Everybody's got them. especially most, yeah. most successful people. And, you know, there's all this word, talk about narcissism, which is just puts me over the edge because a lot of it's just not spoken about. But narcissism, as people that have severe pathology, they have much more than narcissism. They can be Machiavellian, meaning they're highly manipulative. They can be psychopathic, meaning they're cold and callous. So narcissistic traits, yes, they can make you selfish and self-absorbed, but I think the drugs are what really drove him to to lose it with me. Did you ever tell him about the drug intake? Or were you too scared? Oh, no. I, oh, no, no. I'm from Brooklyn. <laughs> I used to <clears throat> confront him about it all the time, but I think you understand this. When you're in the throes of your addiction, he he couldn't hear me, and I just always believed that my love could change him, and I, I realized it couldn't. But how naive are you then to that? Oh, ridiculously. Yeah, I didn't know, because I didn't grow up with anybody that did drugs like that, right? So I had no clue in, the in my early 20s, you know, what was this, 25 years ago? Nobody was even talking about all this. So I had I was so naive. What age did you have your first kid? 25. And how was he with the baby? Good. Did they ever try and... Because kids can... Kids are tough. They're fucking hard work, if we're honest. But especially if you're not in a good place. Yeah. But sometimes... I, I changed for my kids. I had to. Because yeah. Because they need a father. Yeah. And, um, but it can be difficult. So did he ever think, okay, maybe it's time to change? Did they ever try and change? Back then, or was he it not did. till later on in life? No, he did. He did change. Um, he's he's an excellent father. My children are very close with him, and so what happened was it's different than the movie. I said to him, "You have to get sober, or else." I said, "I'm not going to sit here and watch you kill yourself." 
And that was when he like threw my clothing and jewelry and lit them in the fire and put, put them on fire in the fireplace. And <clears throat> he was furious with me, screaming, how fucking dare you tell me? You know, just went, I don't even want to say it on the podcast because it's too many bad words. Um, and and then he told me that he was taking my daughter on a, and he was whacked out of his mind on coke. And he chartered a private plane. And I was like, no, you're not. I mean, you can't, you don't fuck with my kids. And <clears throat> that was when he, um, he, he tried to drive away with her. That scene in the movie where he drives into the wall. So that happened. But then right after that, he did get sober. So me standing up to him, and it was very violent, clearly. Um, but he did get sober. So that was good. And what happened when you had the second? Was it, you, so you've got two kids, Carter? Yeah, uh, Carter. Yeah, so he was already born. Carter was born mm -hmm. at that point, but he was a little baby. How was that when you've got two kids in your scenes, the failed marriage and someone's not, it's just a lost soul where you can't, you know your love's not enough where they're going to change. Yeah. How hard is that feeling? It's hot, terrible. It's probably, I'm, it's probably one of the worst feelings in the world when you can't help somebody that you love <clears throat> see that drugs are killing them. It's probably the most helpless feeling in the world, and especially when you have two little children to take care of. And I think they were a big part of my motivation to just be like, you cannot do this anymore. And also, I didn't want to see him kill himself. I mean, he started to get into coke, and then that was it. How hard is that for people who's in that sort of relationship where they genuinely do love their person? Yeah. But it's 10, 20 years, and you can just see the strain in their face yeah. that they're in a shit relationship. But how... Hard is it for someone to be in a relationship with someone they love? They've got kids. They've not really got much income. They're kind of they're not stuck there because people can make changes. But if you're in that relationship 10, 20, 30 years, you tend to see people just die with that relationship because it's yeah. went so far. Like how hard is it to actually come out a toxic, abusive relationship? It's hard, but it can be done. What are the steps to for it to be done? Well, first of all, you have to realize that you're in one. You know, you have to really have radical acceptance that you're in a toxic bond or a trauma bond and that this person isn't going to change. And then you have to take the steps to either make yourself more confident outside of the relationship, also get a lot of support um, through friends or a trauma-informed therapist, and really work on yourself. Because when you're in a trauma bond, like I was, I was so focused on Jordan because he was an addict and like I'm always trying to figure him out and trying to figure out his mood. And and so I think I what I tell my patients is let's turn the mirror back on you. Let's get curious about you. What do you want? What do you need? How do you really want to live your life? And so put your energy toward yourself, making yourself stronger and getting resourced financially, emotionally, relationally. And then you have to face your fear. Was he cheating? He was cheating, but I didn't. That wasn't what our fights were about, like the movie talks about. Because obviously, you get her curls in the park yeah, and this yeah. and that. Did you know about that? No. Or were you just, or did, did you know and you just try to block it out? No, I didn't know about that really. No, that wasn't real. The the big fights were about drugs. And how was these? Were these friends? Were they the same? Or crazy. They, yeah. Nuts. Madness attracts madness, though. Yeah, yeah, just crazy, crazy people. Yeah. <laughs> Very crazy people. But you must have been one as well, though, because you were involved in it. You don't, no matter what anybody says, yeah. you, we still make choices. And we talk about trauma bonding, which is yeah. difficult to break free. But the cho everybody's choices, it's insane. You going to that party the very first time, seeing someone pull their cock out, yeah. seeing him fucked up. I'm never going back there again. I don't want to see these people. So yeah. part of your madness was... It's, a, it's sexy for some weird fucking yeah. insane oh, reason. Yeah, I mean, certainly I was young and dumb and delusional. I would say that. And what I'm else going to say, though, is that I did leave the party and he did pursue me, right? So I think that when I was a young girl, I relied a lot on being chosen mm -hmm. instead of like really using my brain and being like, is this really what I want? And so, yeah, I mean, listen, once I was in it, I lost my mind because that's what happens in a trauma bond. You do go crazy and you do lose your mind. Did you feel as if you totally lost yourself? Completely lost myself. Completely. When was the moment you realized? Oh, I think it was 
all along the way. It's like a slow, uh, I, I describe it in the book, like a like an onion layer just peeling off, just slow and steady. Every day, every week, every month, yeah, I started to lose myself. Where did you get married? In Anguilla. Where's that? It's a Caribbean island. How many people? I don't remember. Maybe like 200. Was he sober? No. But I was. <laughs> do you have photos and stuff? Yes. Um, yeah, I do. Yeah. yeah. What about the one with the... You know, I know you spoke about it a few times when you're on the boat, the helicopter falls off, yeah, you nearly die. Is. How true is that? That's very true. That was extraordinarily scary. What happened? There was, just like the movie shows, we got into a squall and the waves, I don't even know how big they were, but they were crashing over the boat. And I definitely thought I was dying. For sure, I thought I was dying. And I remember, I think it was the Italian Coast Guard tried to save us. They couldn't. But then they rerouted um, an intrepid ship of the Italian Navy, and they came and got us off the boat with a frogman, pulled us 40 feet up. How far into the relationship was that? That was towards the end. I would say about a year and a half. Was he high on the boat? Yeah, I mean, not when we were going through the squall. I think everybody kind of sobered right up. Because, you know, when you think you're going to die, yeah, it was very, very scary. I wouldn't yeah. wish that on anybody. Yeah, it just all sounds mad. It's like in movies we glorify it, but we, because it's acting as well, we don't really look at actually, wait a minute, that's real life, what people are actually going through. The right. pain, the misery, the torment, everything yeah. is kind of dark. It's a it's a low vibration. It's a, It was a very, very dark, dark, sad existence over time. What was your mum saying? Oh, my mom was like, run like hell. Yeah, but you know, when you're in love and you think you know better, and then once you have children and you're locked in it, it's um, it's hard to extract yourself out. And you know, we're talking about this now, you and I, 25 years later, right? So I can talk about it in a calm, light way. I'm sure five years out, or even 10 years out, it was a lot more difficult for me to talk about it. In the movie as well, who was the aunt from England? Was that true? Mm -hmm. Where they were trying to ship money to, yep. I don't know, Switzerland? Yep. Um, was that all true? Completely true. Was she with Jordan? No. Did they have a relationship No, with she was just some cra a crazy lady. <laughs> she wasn't an aunt or anything? No, she was my aunt. Uh -huh. Yeah, she was my mother's half-sister. And did she die? Like... She did die, yeah. She had a brain tumor, yeah. Looks sick. So the movie was majority of legit no man. yeah it was very it was accurate the the thing about the movie is that as you say they take they took my trauma our trauma all of the trauma and made it like a farce so it makes it palatable can you laugh at it yes yes and see the funny side oh or totally. do you look at it and you think what the fuck <laughs> what were you thinking you know because I think... it does glamorize it it does look sexy for me if they're partying yeah. I would want to be at that party. Yeah. Even though I know it's fucked up, but it just still looks fun as well. Yeah. Men are, like you say, we're vulnerable and very, we take drink and drugs to heal or cover up some sort of pain that we're dealing yeah. with. Yeah, yeah. From my own opinion, but the parties just look fucking amazing. They were fun. Yeah. They were fun, yeah. So, yeah, so I can, but I can laugh at it because I've been in billions of years of therapy. I've processed it so much, you know, and now... I've become an expert on the topic. So I've, what's the word? I've metabolized it and integrated it enough to be able to sit here and talk about it calmly. But in my early 30s, recovering from it was 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 quite a time. So you have the kids. When does it come on top for him with the police and the FBI? Was that another strain on your life? That was about a year later. After he got sober, that happened about a year later. So when did he get sober? I mean, I don't know the exact time, maybe 1988, maybe he, or 1987, then he got arrested in 1988, or around that, those that, those years. What made him get sober this time? Well, that's what, what made him get sober was what I said to him, you have to get sober, and he went crazy and that whole thing. Did he go to rehab? Yeah, he went to rehab, yeah. How was that feeling for you when the great. person that you love is actually trying to make changes? Oh my God, it was great. But I was, well, it was, for me, it was mixed because I, I felt happy for him, but I was furious with him with what he had done to me mm -hmm. in the name of, you know, in me trying to get him sober. Yeah. 
So it was mixed for me. Yeah, that's the hard thing. Do you think you could have fell in love with him when he got sober if you never knew him? Or was it the madness of the past, who he was, that was more appealing to you? Yeah, I think, you know, I think um, I definitely could have fallen in love. Yeah. I'm from Brooklyn. He's from Queens. We both are very ambitious, driven people. Yeah, we have two amazing kids. We were meant to be, right? So you've got two amazing kids. He's got sober. Yeah. Why leave him then? Because, like I said, I was so, it was so many years of emotional abuse and coercive control. And then the final act of that whole crazy day when I got kicked down the stairs backwards and they, he drove my daughter into a wall. I, You can't get over that. I couldn't get over that. I just couldn't. And once he got arrested, I was like, okay, he can't do anything to me anymore. He can't hurt me. He can't try to take my kids. You know, he, now he's the government's problem. That must have been a kick in the balls. He's got sober. His missus have left him and then the FBI have came through the door. Yeah. Yep. Do you think he would have handled all that if he wasn't sober? If he was on the drugs, could there potentially have been suicidal as well with all the pressures and strains and stresses of life? He's really strong. Yeah, no, I, I yeah, don't get that, but you I never know. I don't know. I don't know. Especially I with kids and stuff, but again, with the pressures of life in prison and yeah. losing your partner, it is a lot for a man. Yeah, yeah, he's super strong. He's very resilient. He's made the changes. He's got clean a, a strength in itself. Yeah, yeah. So... This was seven years into your marriage, you left? Seven to eight years in, yeah. And then how was that? How was it to eventually build up the courage to leave? Do you think it was easier to leave knowing that he was sober and he was more in a sane state? Yes. Instead of being the violent, aggressive, you couldn't have probably said anything because of the controlling nature that you're not leaving? Well, at that point, for me, I didn't care what he was. It didn't matter to me. I was done with him. Did After you, how he had abused me. Do you then see that shift in your energy changing from yes. feminine to masculine? Yeah, I think that's a good way to say it. Yeah, I, and I, I just was done with it. Like, you know, and I remember telling him one night in a restaurant about six months after he got sober, how, what a hard time it was for me and how much it had all hurt me. And he was like, it wasn't that bad. And it was at that, that was a really important moment in my life where I just thought, that's so callous and insensitive. You know, you're still not having empathy for me. So his lack of empathy towards me too was another reason why I was able to leave. And the good news was I knew that when I left and my kids would go to him, he was sober now. So he felt safer? Uh-huh. How important is it for a man to listen to women? Because we pretend to listen. <laughs> and we are, like you say, we are sensitive, but I don't know how if we know how to show love we show yeah. it in different ways. I, I'm speaking for myself, but I know yeah. a lot of people who, who feel the same as well. But if a woman's talking to you with a... F men are silly. We don't know how to accept that and, and actually genuinely listen and go, okay, what do I need to do to change that? Yeah. I understand you, I'm listening, but we don't. We'll either make a joke or we'll book a holiday or there's another watch. Or right, right. We'll try and replace it with something. I don't yes. know if... I can't speak for every man, man but I understand. I'm only speaking it from... Yeah, sure. Maybe you, my side. It. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like yeah. how does how do you accept that then? If someone that you're speaking from the heart, yes, he's changed, but he's kind of shut it down. Because yeah, you've bottled it up. It's like going to someone who's abused you or whatever, and you're trying to open up to someone they just totally shut you down. Yeah, some people could then put that block up for the rest of their life and never speak about it again. Yeah, yeah. What happens if he says, "Okay, listen, I'm sorry, I love you, and I should never have done that." Would you have stayed with him, or was it always done? I, I, I think, I don't know if I would have stayed with him, but uh, there's another piece about love that I talk about. If someone can't hear you, they can't love you. So how do men listen better? Validate. Validate my feelings. You know what, Nadine? That was really hard. I could see how that could have been hard for you, and I'm really sorry. That's it. Do you think you played it down a lot? Maybe he needed to for his own mind, you know, which I can understand. But at some point, the relationship can't just be all about him. And why did they kick you down the stairs? Oh, because I was he was trying to take my daughter, and I was chasing him that, so that he couldn't take my daughter. Was that the worst time? Was that the darkest time in the relationship? Definitely. Yes. And he went to prison, was it 22 months? Yes. And yes. how was that? 
Well, that happens many, many, many years later. Four years later, five years later. Yeah, I think five or six years later that happened for him. And we were all living in California at that time. Um, him and I got along very well. And he would see the kids all the time. The kids visited him. So I don't know what it was like for him while he wrote the book there. Mm -hmm. So he made good time. He made good use of it. So when you're then motto, trying to spread your wings, trying to find love, still young. Yeah. Um, you go through a toxic relationship, very abusive, very controlling. Then it's over. Your ex-husband changes. He's a better father. He's a, probably a better friend and more understanding mm -hmm. than he's ever been. Life's going great. You've probably done some therapy. You're kind yes. of moving on with that. Yeah. When does he say then, okay, I'm writing a book about my life? <laughs> does that then think, well, fuck you? Or you're not really thinking. For me, I'm just looking from what I would say. I would think, what? I've got had to go through all this and then I need to relive it. Yeah. How was your reaction? That, that to was it? exactly my reaction. What was that? Yeah, that was exactly <laughs> it. That was exactly my reaction. I was like, are you kidding me? You know, but again, I just was like, okay, he, well, this is it's, he he has a right to do it. I mean, I can't stop him from doing it. And he he sent me the book, and I screamed and cried, and I threw myself into bed. And then my husband was like, okay, time to get up. And when did you meet your husband after the divorce? About two years after after I left Jordan. You've split up with Jordan. How long did it take to then meet your other partner? Two years. Yep, about two years. Yeah. How was that to get into a relationship, especially coming from that? It was, but it, was it was hard because I had to trust. How do you do that? Uh, slowly over time, you know. Did he ever party, your man? No. Is he the total opposite? He's totally sober now. Um, yeah, he's not the total opposite, no. But he's he was older, I was older. Um, we just, we've been married for 24 years. He's a good husband. He loves my kids. He had three kids. We were a modern day Brady Bunch. And it was nice. So life was going good. You're in a pretty... So you come from chaos. So in life as well, when you come from a life of chaos and then it becomes peaceful, sometimes we can get it mixed up with being peaceful and boring. Yeah. Did you ever think, okay, this is a bit boring because you were used to that? No, life? I like boring. Or did you, were you just happy with it? I like boring. I like drama free. Yeah, I like boring. Because people are so used to chaos that they stay in it for the rest of their life. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't grow up with a lot of chaos, though, so that time was a very um, crazy time for me. But no, no, I like boring. It's okay. And then when when the when he wrote the book, that was when I went back to school to get my master's. What was Jordan like when you met your new man? He was great. Was he, he? Was, he was. He was. My, my current husband is great, and he said, I'm going to call up Jordan and take him to breakfast. I was like, good luck with that. And they went to breakfast, and he said, I know what it's like to have somebody around my kids. I want to go introduce myself to him. And I think Jordan really respected that. They have a great relationship. Yeah, that makes it easier. Yeah, it's nice. He ain't doing that if he was still fucking on the quaaludes. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, he's not. He was very He was very glad that he wanted, you know, my, my husband showed him respect. So the book comes out, Scorsese comes, DiCaprio, um... Margo, yeah, beautiful. Like as an unbelievable movie. When, did you realize how far it would have went? But with Jordan's mindset, everything he took, he's always took to the top, no matter what it was. Yeah. Did you realize how big his book would have went and how far it would have went when he wrote it? No, I could have never anticipated that. No, no. Uh -uh. And what? When did you start finding out that they were going to turn it into a movie? Scorsese, one of the greatest directors of all time. DiCaprio, yeah. one of the greatest actors of yeah. all time. I would say probably maybe a year and a half before they were going to do it, I think. So what are you thinking again? Did it bring back a lot of emotions and trauma? Because now completely. it's going to go to a wider audience. Completely, completely. Did yep. you have to do more therapy? I did a lot more therapy. <laughs> huh? Hence why I became a therapist, because I was like, therapy has really helped me manage this crazy life I've had. What was it like going to therapy for the first time? Oh, I like therapy. It's yeah. good, yeah. It's good. It's nice to go to a non-judgmental, accepting place where you could say whatever you want and you get to work on yourself. Yeah, it was great. How long did it take to come out the other end? 
and I'm still doing it. <laughs> <laughs> 30 years later, I'm still fucked up. <laughs> I think I'm still, I don't think the growth ever ends. Yeah, that's know? what it's all about. Do you think sometimes, though, we can constantly search and forget to live? Yes, yes. The last the last uh, chapter in my book is called Go Live. The book's amazing, by the way. Thank you. Because it was a great movie. People then loved the great. characters from it. Yes. So it didn't. It wasn't a negative. I don't know, I can't speak for you, but it didn't yeah. seem to be a negative. It seemed everybody's life from that movie enhanced positively. Yeah. Was that the case when it came out? Yeah, I mean, it seems like that. You know, when it came out, I was getting my doctorate and I really didn't speak about it much because I had nothing to say, you know, and I just really cared about my kids and what they were going to think about it and how they were going to deal with it because I forgot how old they were, but maybe 16 and 18 or 17 and 19. So that's really was my main concern. And I got to go to a private screening of Paramount with my husband. And so I sat down and we were like, okay, here we go. And then when they showed us the movie, I was like, it wasn't that bad. You know, did it was you, it was good. Did you realize how big it was going to be? No, I had no idea. I mean, I should have realized with Jordan, he goes big or goes home. Um, but no, I didn't have any idea. What sort of input did you have in it? Because Zero. Because Margot Robbie's a big, she's a big part in the movie. Yeah, I met Margot. Um, they asked me if I would fly and meet her, and I was actually taking my daughter to college. So I took my daughter to college, and they taped my accent, and I got to meet her. She was so young then. She was 22, the same age I was, and she was she was great. Now that you, I've spoke to you and seen you, you can see the resemblance in the way she speaks. She fucking nailed that part. She nailed it. Didn't she? Yeah, she did a great job. No, she did a great job. And we went to dinner, and I, I talk about this in one of my TikToks, but she was like, I don't want to take my clothes off, I, this, but I don't, I don't know how to say it to them. And I said, you know, that feeling that you feel right there, Margo, like speaking truth to power, that's how I felt my whole marriage. So think about that when you're doing your role. And uh, she did a great job. She was so good and funny and feisty. And Did you see yourself in that character? A little bit. I mean, it's not that much fun having the most beautiful woman in the world play you that's 20 years younger. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but she was amazing. And, you know. How many times you watched the movie? Oh, not that many. Probably four or five. Do you ever get upset watching it or do you just laugh now? You know, I... Sometimes, like, I just watched it recently and I got a little bit more upset. It, I think it just depends upon my mood. Yeah. But I don't, like, spend my time watching it every day. <laughs> so when did you start getting into the therapy side of things and understanding, really, understanding you, coming out the other end and realizing, okay, I can help others? Like, when did you start really working on that? Well, I became a therapist in 56, so I became a therapist, uh, I guess, maybe 15 years ago. And so I didn't really know that I was going to specialize in trauma bonds. That wasn't my intention. But, you know, the, the book of the movie came out. And again, I didn't say anything right when the movie came out. And then what happened to my therapy practice is I saw so many women coming into my practice being experienced coercive control, emotional abuse, manipulation, betrayal. And so I said, OK, being the nerdy good student that I am. I said, I'm going to go back to the research and figure this out. And so I researched it and then it became my expertise. What's the biggest red flags in a man? Oh, there's a lot, but there can be a lot. You know, we talked about love bombing. We talked about words not met, like words not matching actions is a huge one when they tell you they're going to do something, but then they don't do it. Anybody who's trying to coercively control you and doesn't give you the space to be who you are. Constant lies, you know, well, that's words not matching actions or gaslighting, denying your reality when you know they're lying to you and you confront them and they're like, you're crazy. What's the biggest red flag in a woman? Oh, all the same things. The exact same? The exact same things, yeah. Do you think men and women are more alike than people like to let on? I think, sir, I think we all have personalities that can make us very similar. But I, I do think that we're very different just based upon our hormones. Like, I'm sure if you gave me a lot of testosterone, I'd change. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Fuck that. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, we're not giving you anything. 
<laughs> what makes a good relationship, Nadine? What makes a good, strong, healthy relationship? Because no relationship is perfect. I've never no, met a couple who are no. extremely happy. What makes a good... And I can, listen, we live in this society where people talk about mas- toxic masculinity, but with living a life of social media as well, I wouldn't want my partner on social media with the bikinis and around other men. And I, I, I can't accept that. I don't know what, what it is that's ingrained in me, but I couldn't accept it. I'm not drinking. I'm not out partying. I'm not standing in the club. Right. I wouldn't want others, my other half doing that also. Yeah. And there's got to be, is it best to put out the boundaries as, as whatever yes. it is to say, okay, I'm yes. not going to accept yes. that. But then is that you saying that to try and manipulate them to then agree with what you're doing also? So, Anything you can I say can be manipulated yeah. and, and turned around also. Yeah, well, I think setting a boundary is different than intentional manipulation, right? So it's always about the intention, right? If you're just setting a boundary and saying, this isn't something I'll accept, but you're not doing it to intentionally manipulate the person. You're just expressing who you are. That's very different than intentionally lying to someone, manipulating them, gaslighting them. You're just saying, listen, I don't like to cl- go to clubs. Can you respect that and not do that? I mean, the person says yes or no, but you're not trying necessarily to control them. You're just expressing who you authentically are and what you ex- authentically want and need. Mm-hmm. And then your partner, we remember we talked about this, if they can hear you, it's like, yeah, I hear that. That that kind of makes sense. But what? when is it enough? When is it enough to stop working at it? When do you know, okay... It's just not working anymore. I need to walk away. When does it? When, when is that point of it? Because people can go to therapy, couples counselling for years yeah, on for end. Years, for for me, years. That, the relationship done then. But yeah. But again, I, I respect them from keep working at it. Because back in the day, people were married at 17, 18 years old. Right. We were with each other 70, 70, 60, 70 years. Yeah. Nowadays, people don't last 60, 70 minutes. You know <laughs> what I'm saying? So when does it become enough, though, that uh, you need to protect yourself, no matter if there's kids involved? I need to yeah. just walk away. Well, I think that we all, like you say, are, are imperfect. I know I'm very imperfect in my relationship. I know my husband is. But we can hear each other. We can communicate with each other. And we can have some resolution to our problems. So if you have crazy making communication that never goes anywhere, you have a problem. And everybody can do like a one-off bad thing, like we said. But if you see a pattern of behavior a pattern of lying, a pattern of manipulation, a pattern of control that's not going away no matter what, then you need to run like hell. That's that's why, you know, and that's very, you know, and that's why I wrote my book because when you're in it and you're in love, it can be very hard to see it. And especially if you don't understand it. But now there's a lot of information out there where people can get help. And it's the research shows it takes a woman four to seven times to leave a trauma bond. It's a very hard thing to do is to leave somebody you love, but often love isn't enough. When were you at your lowest? Well, for, oh. Which time? <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. When was it the lowest of the low? Was it after being kicked down the stairs? Yeah. And you, was that that was lowest? probably the lowest, one was, of the lowest. There must have been a lot of happy times. When, when, were, you, when were you at your happiest? Oh, I think when our children were born, of course, and um, like moving into our house, all those things of of newly being married. In the beginning, I think really connecting with each other emotionally. Did you have friends in that relationship? Or were you just, again, oh. isolated? Oh, I had so many friends. Did you? Yeah. So you weren't isolated in the house, just... Yeah, no, no. I'm a very relational person, mm-hmm. so I have like not tons of friends, but I have enough of good friends who are still my friends mm-hmm. till today. Yeah, but I had friends. And a lot of our friends were friends. You know, we would, that was the fun part. Like we would all hang out together with our husbands and our kids. Mm-hmm. That was the fun part. What What was it like being a mother? Do you think you could have left the relationship earlier if you never had kids? Yes, being a mother is the most important experience of my life. How so? It's the most wonderful experience. My, I mean, I could cry talking about it, as you can see. I just love being a mother. As you talked about, I'm a nurturer, I'm a caretaker. And I don't know, there's just something so magical about it. And my children now are 30 and 28, and they're my best friends. My daughter's a therapist. My son's a rapper. I have three stepdaughters who I'm very close with. 
There's nothing like giving birth to this beautiful little soul and then helping them to develop and become these wonderful people. Yeah. And that to me is like the most important thing about Jordan and I, and I always say this, you know, the one thing is that we've both been really good parents mm -hmm. and we both really love our kids and it shows in who they are today. And so a lot of, and it's really hard when you're in a trauma bond usually to have that experience. And that doesn't mean we haven't wanted to kill each other even after we've gotten divorced. We're strong personalities, but we've always come together for the children. Because when you talk about your children, you can see the nurturing, loving, natural yes. thing a, a woman should be. Yes. But then again, you talk about the masculine energy as well. Do you see a big change in who you were from 22? Everybody changes through time anyway, but yeah. you see a massive change in yeah. being that submissive. Mm -hmm. Okay, Jordan. Yeah. Listen, you weren't fucking stupid. You're from Brooklyn. Do you know what I mean? You've got yes. have some sort of backbone, but do you feel the shift in you from sure. back then to now? Oh, yeah. I'm totally much more empowered. In fact, I was thinking about that. I was driving over here. It's like, it feels good yeah. to feel strong. Yeah. You know, yeah, it feels you tell good. To fuck off. Oh, it does. It feels <laughs> great. And you know, especially at fifty six, because there's so much like bullshit around ageism, especially mm -hmm. with women. And I mean, yeah, do I wish I didn't have so many wrinkles and whatever else is happening with my body and mm -hmm. that sort of stuff? But I love what's happening with my mind. It's fun. Yeah, because that's if, if you can take whatever control you want in there and think and believe what you want to believe, the world's unstoppable. Everything's limitless. Yeah. Yeah, and it's um I don't know, it just it it's nice to be able to think that you can influence yourself. And one of the things that I work with with the women I work with is they're so after you've been in trauma bond you feel so much fear. Um because you've been so controlled and a lot of times the partners can be dominating. And that's that fear is real. And but when you when you get older, at least for me, I'm facing my fears every day. You know, I used to hate to do podcasts. I would feel so insecure and so uh, self-conscious, right? But I've done them enough now. I faced my fears enough to be able to do it. And so really working with the women that I work with on facing their fears, approaching life. How do you face your fears? I just keep showing up and doing what I fear mm -hmm. and talking myself through it, saying nice things to myself. You can do it. You can do it. And teaching myself that mistakes, failure, rejection, they're all part of life. It just means you're trying. I mean, have you ever been rejected or failed? Yeah, all the time. Right. It's, it's fucking painful. And it's all day. But that's why a lot of people stay in their comfort because it is painful. Rejection is the worst, especially for men. A man, it's um, like I say, men, we're, we're pretty simple creatures, but we, I've got enough male friends and understand men enough, understand my life and upbringing, the choices I made. We are kind of fucked up as well. We are lost souls and it's sad because... yeah. The majority of Jordan Peterson, Peterson says that the majority of people who are in prison are men. The majority of people who are homeless are men. The majority of people who are suicidal are men. The majority yes. of people who yes. fight in wars are men. The majority of people who have shitty jobs are men. Mm -hmm. And I used to think, wow. But then I thought, well, wait a minute. What does that, what does that say then? It means women are smarter. Because women are making better choices. Mm -hmm. Men don't need to make those choices. Men don't need to go to prison. Men don't need to be suicidal. There's something... Yeah. disconnected from man yeah. and I go back from again breastfeeding and um, cutting the umbilical cord which is so important it's full of stem cells and nutrients but again everything so as soon as you cut that and everything's skin to skin and kids can think they're in the womb for up to nine months or whatever it is and some kids and women need to work kids are in nurseries or whatever and yeah. I don't know what, whatever it stems from but there's something that I miss with the man and the feelings. Listen, we're men as well. We've got to just fucking pull the trousers up sometimes and just dig deep and get on with it mm -hmm. because we can't be crying every day. It's mm -hmm. not our natural being. It's good mm -hmm. to, listen, men cry, it's great, listen, whatever. But we yeah. can't be crying every fucking day. Right. Do you know what I mean? As a man, you've got to be taking everybody's pain on and pressures. Okay, I've got you. My kids are safe. My missus is safe. My mother's safe. Okay, listen, if I need to fucking have a moment, I'll have a moment, but I still need to show up the next day mm -hmm. and make sure everything's safe again. Mm -hmm. From my own opinion, um, I don't know, I think people, I think the world's just becoming a, I don't know, it can be a bit soft, if I'm honest, Nadine. The world is becoming soft? Yeah, a bit yeah. soft. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, um, what do you think the main triggers are for 
like a steady relationship and a, a broken relationship? What is the, the main ones that break relationships down? What's the main triggers? I think a big part of it is lying. Think so? Yeah, I think that if you can't trust your partner, you don't really have a foundation. I mean, we all have white little lies. But I think consistently lying to a partner, I think consistently betraying a partner, stepping outside the relationship. You know, we talked about drugs already. But those are things that, and, and, and really, like I talked about, con- trying to control your partner. Nobody wants to be controlled. I mean, I don't want to be controlled. Do you want to be controlled? No. Yeah, just want to be me. So lying, betraying, controlling a partner, abusing them, manipulating them, those, that's not love. Do you miss the old life? No. A wee bit? No, I don't. <laughs> I don't. I like my new life. How was it writing your book? Hardest thing I've ever done. Why? Oh, it's so much work. It's so much work to take all the research and mix it in with the stories. And you think about a book is 60, 70,000 words and every word counts. Um, and I kind of have that personality of like, oh, yeah, I'll write a book. And then I write it. I'm like, what on earth did I get myself into? But I, it's my life's work. I know it's good because I know just so I get so many messages from women all over the world. Like, your book is helping me so much. I'm not feeling crazy. Your book is validating me. So that makes, so that makes it all worth it. But it was very hard. It was a very humbling experience. Let's just say that. Obviously, you're a therapist, but was that like a therapy session for you? Yeah. Did that make, did it bring again all the emotions and feelings back yes. of everything? Yes, especially chapter two. Chapter two, where I write about the man, is he twisted or tender? I said to my husband, I hate you. I hate Jordan. I hate my father. He was like, okay, when's this book going to be over? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was hard. Was there a time, though, you hated every man because of... How a man put you through, what one man put you through? I think it was just writing about that personality. It was just very, it was a process that really ate me up from the inside out. It was hard to do. How is that when you feel as if you're losing your mind? How hard is that for a woman? You know, when I, when I, luckily for me, when I feel, my mother taught me the most best quote. She said to me, just when you think you're losing your mind, you might be regaining it. And so, I let myself lose my mind. I let myself feel my emotions. I let, like you say, like I give myself that moment just to cry in bed or flail about and really express them. They come out, they process, and then I'm like, okay. So it's okay. I mean, I, I expect to to feel a lot of feelings and lose my mind. That's part of life. When are you at your happiest now? Oh my God, when I'm with my grandson. He's so cute. I have two grandsons, and they're just, it's so, it's magical. From each kid? So, no, I have, my daughter has, I just had a boy, Rory. Congratulations. I think that's kind of a Scottish name, oh, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. 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 And then uh, my stepdaughter has a three, she has a three and a half, almost four year old boy. They're so fun. Yeah, Stephen, he's just got a granddaughter as well. Uh, it's yeah. the best, right? Do you think you can enjoy it better being a grandparent? Because totally. Because you're out there 24 you can. Best. Give them back after a few hours. It's the best. It's the best. There's a there's a pillow that says, "If I knew being a grandparent was so good, I would have done it first. And that's it's just great. It's so much fun. I love being with my family. That to me is, and my good friends. Like that to me is what it's all about. Why do you think it is easier being a grand? Not easier, but do you think it's because of what you've learned being yes. a parent, or yes. is it because it's not your own kid? Because you would still die for your grandkids as yeah. much as you would your kids anyway. But yeah. why do you think it is more enjoyable? I think both the reasons you said. I think both <laughs> yeah. the reasons you said. You can give them back, and you've already been through it. You're not as nervous. Mm-hmm. You know, you're just like, oh, they'll be fine. I drop my son on his head. He's fine. <laughs> <laughs> what did your kids say when they watched the movie? You know, that's a good question. They um, they went to the premiere with Jordan, and they sat next to their grandparents, which they said was, like, totally awkward. And they were fine with it. They're, I had spoken to them about their dad throughout their whole lives. So this was not some big shock, who he was. And they're like, that's my dad. Okay, you know, then they're crying to me about pimples and their boyfriends. They went back to their lives. Yeah, because they've been because you can they wouldn't have knew the extent of the lifestyle if it wasn't 
out there on a book or TV. Right. Do you know what I'm saying? So you can you can hide and mask a lot. Do you think it improves your relationship with your kids because then they get a better understanding of what what you actually went through? Yeah, I um, I mean, I don't know if it improves it, but are were you scared that they could have not turned on Jordan? But no, nah, because I've it... never, I've always supported them to have a really good relationship with their dad. I think that's something that's really important. Mm-hmm. You know, just because him and I didn't get along in the end, that's still their dad. Like they of have course. to have a good relationship with him, and I think that's important for them and for him. You know, did you travel the world then? Look, was it a luxurious lifestyle where you were traveling in yachts and helicopters and private planes? Yes. Did yes. you love that lifestyle? I uh, I didn't like the private planes. They were really freaky because you feel everything in a private plane. Um, they're very bumpy. Uh, the yacht, of course, we had crazy moments of fun. Um, so, yeah, it, it had its fun moments. But What was your happiest moment in that relationship? Mm, that's a tricky one. Probably in the beginning, before I knew what I was really getting myself into, mm-hmm. when I was a young, hopeful girl. Yeah. What age do you think you should fall in love? I believe people should. Because people can fall in love at 17 and be with each other the rest of their lives. Yeah. But how far in a relationship do you think you should really wait? Do you think people should wait? Because like you say, everything's lust at the start. Everything's just yeah. exciting and feeling good do you you think people should wait a bit longer before getting to know the person before committing i do i do but i know love has its own way of working people but i do i think it's i think it's better to wait till you're at least in your late 20s to really they say it takes seven years to fully get to know somebody fuck see i can't last seven minutes (laughs) once there's no end why do you think love is so painful sometimes but but yes the purest form of anything on this planet, but yeah, it is painful to love someone or be in love. And for men, anyway, relationship breakups are one of the hardest a, a, a man can go through. Yeah, we don't speak about it. We don't sit with the friends and go, oh, "Do you know what? I miss her." You no, go and yeah. get fucking high on coke, or <laughs> go to the strip joint, or get alcohol, suppress it all. Right. Women sit and talk shit in kitchens and go with their girlfriends and just talk it out. Yeah, men don't really heal from relationships yeah Yeah, that's sad yeah why do you think that is well i think love hurts because we are social beings and we we're meant to belong to people i mean we can't live alone you know a baby won't survive unless a mother's face is in front of it and so i think it hurts so much because people that we fall in love with matter to us a lot and when they don't act the way we want them to or they abandon us, you know, we feel like it could feel like death. I mean, heartbreak feels like death. Do you believe in soulmates? Mm, I don't know. It's about airy fairy, isn't it? Yeah, I'm really more research based. <laughs> <laughs> I'd I mean... imagine if you were to meet a man now, would you have like a fucking checklist? <laughs> and go, okay, okay, okay. Would you have like no. do you look um, obviously know. you're in a happy relationship but if you've seen a man would you look for would you, the telltale signs be there automatically would you have something you would search yes. for I, if, I was, if I was yeah. dating now yeah. yeah I have a pathological lover checklist <laughs> and I would say check uh-huh. and I actually put an assessment for it on my website yeah. yeah especially for young girls I know what it was like to be that young naive girl and so especially for young women yeah, relationships are fucking crazy did you ever struggle? How's your your kids' relationships? Did you ever worry that your especially your daughter that made the same choice as you did? Yes, she didn't. She married the greatest guy. Which was was that a concern though? Because you know how easy it can be. Yeah, then. sure, sure. But she never. She's much smarter than I am. <laughs> <laughs> she never showed signs of my ridiculousness. Yeah, yeah. And my son, he's he's just a sweet young man. So he's great. How's the relationship with you and Jordan now? Good. Good, just just fine. Yep, he's remarried to a lovely young woman. Um, you know, we're grandparents, and I don't really see him that much anymore because now my kids are big. Mm-hmm. So there's not really much of a reason to see him. Mm-hmm. But when we see each other, we saw each other when our when our grandson was born, Rory, and we hugged, and it was a nice, happy moment. Was it? Yeah, Is very that happy. Like, like, yeah, because obviously you shared a lot of time with someone, but they say it's love only lasts seven years. They believe that relationship wise 
The snake no. always feels like probably seven years. Yeah, it could. I, I could say in one marriage, like you can, in one marriage, you could be like have three marriages, mm -hmm. three different experiences of marriage. Yeah, like I'm with my husband now 24 years. It's not like when we first met, you know, but it's like the love has deepened. How do you last 24 fucking years? <laughs> huh? I told you I'm very tolerant and driven. <laughs> I told you. I don't know. We just lasted and um, I'm what's glad. The, what's the key though? Do you think the broken relationship from the last time helped this relationship yes. or did it make it harder? No, I think it helped. And I think um, we both just really wanted it to work. Mm -hmm. So when I was a pain in the ass, he would check me. When he was a pain in the ass, you know, I would check him. And thing in the end, we both wanted it to work. We wanted to have that family unit. And be, like I could tell you, if you could stay till the grandkids stay. <laughs> Because it's so nice when everybody's around us. So we both wanted it to work. Why did you never have any more kids? Oh, because I had one of each and they're perfect. Enough. Enough. I don't want, I didn't want more kids. How yep. many do you have? Three. Oh boy, you're brave. Do you, did you ever worry that the other relationship could have broke down? You'd have had two marriages and... For sure. Do you then doubt yeah. yourself and who you are to then try and keep a man as well? If it's always broken relationships. Of course, of course. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. If, well, when I had problems in my relationship, I'd be like, oh my God, imagine I get divorced again. But we figured it out. Yeah. What do you think the key is to a healthy relationship? I think mutual respect. And I talked about this in the beginning, hearing each other. Like not getting defensive, you know, and not personalizing everything. I think that, you know, not everything's about you when you're in a marriage. Sometimes your partner's just in a bad mood. Uh -huh. It's not always about you, but we can hear each other. When I first met my husband and I said to him, oh, that really bugged me when you did that. He goes, oh, okay, I hear you. I was like, what? I couldn't believe he could hear me. What's wrong with this? Man? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, what? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, we've had a bumpy road too. Life, the course of true love never did run smooth. Yeah. How did he deal with that? The movie coming out? That must have been tough on him. Not That's tough, but... You know yeah. what I'm saying? To see all that shit yeah. and your partner out there. Yeah. Then that could, do you know what I mean? As a man, speaking from a man, sure. I would like to see it. Sure. But um, he must be an understanding man. That's he I'm is. Saying. He is. I mean, look, listen, I'm here talking about my ex-husband, right? Yeah, and he's yeah. totally cool about it. He understands my mission in life. He knows what I want to do. But he's um, and at least told me he'll be on the golf course and, you know, people will say, oh, you know, my ex-wife the Duchess of Bay Ridge, and the guys will be like, oh, your wife was naked in the movie. He's like, that wasn't my wife. Yeah. He's no, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you think, you, could you turn the book into a movie, or a follow-up from your own life story? Could what you I? went through, yeah, and yeah. the trauma and all the pain yeah. and overcoming stuff. Yeah, I just don't want to do that. Yeah, no. enough's enough. Enough's enough. I, I, take, I took the wolf vehicle, which I'm grateful for, and used it in my way. Right? Jordan used it in his way. I get to use it in my way. Yeah, I love that. That's what it's all about. Yeah. You know what I mean? Take it as a positive. Right. You're fucking enhanced everything. I like to right. say, you're, everything's enhanced. People know who you are. He's what people want you on podcast. Why not you talk about the pain of the past? Because, like you say, it wasn't all painful. Right. There were some amazing fucking moments. Some That's of the best right. moments of your life where you look back and think, fuck me. At least I'm here <laughs> on your deathbed. You've done, <laughs> you know what? I'm not going out this fucking life all unscathed and right. perfect. We're going through a little fucked up, but wow, have I lived. How yeah, many people I've can lived. say they were on a boat and a helicopter crashed <laughs> and they're getting lifted out in the air? No, not many people could say that. No. See, when you're speaking in therapy, your therapist must have been thinking she's fucking full of shit. She must have been thinking you're making half of that shit up. You know, the thing is that when I was going to become, when I was becoming therapist and the movie came out, I was like, who the hell is going to want to come to me as a therapist? I really had that moment. But then people were like, wait, but you went through that and you came out here. We do want to come to you. So, you know, I was worried about it, but mm -hmm. it actually all worked out. So all these years later, you're still working on yourself? Yes. I'm not in therapy this, this right now, but yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as a therapist, you have to be. So for anybody that's maybe in that shit relationship and struggling to leave, what advice would you have for them? I would say to them... Don't isolate, talk about it, let people know what you're going through. Try to get yourself into some trauma-informed therapy, get really educated, and that's why I wrote the book, because education leads to empowerment. And Jonah Hull character, 
great part he played. How close to the characters were real? Very the real. The guy with the teeth and... Was he real? Yeah. Was it? So see when you're watching that, are you... Is it funny in a sense where you're thinking how close it was to being basically a 100% genuine? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they mixed some of the characters yeah, of together. Course. But, you know, yeah, it was it was very genuine. Those guys were crazy. Did you like any of his friends? No. Nah. No, nah, I mean, not not so much. Mm-hmm. Some of them were nicer than others. And how is it when you talk about all that? Because, listen, like I say, it's a massive movie. It's a big part of your life. People are interested in hearing that stuff, but they're also interested in hearing how you overcome it, how you made the changes, mm-hmm. how you never, it never broke you where you're sitting in a corner just shaking. And, <laughs> no. Do you know what I'm saying? You start yes. a beautiful-looking woman, you're doing amazing things, and yeah. that's what it's all about, to give people an understanding that you don't have to just settle. That's you don't right. have to just fucking accept. You can That's go right. with enough's enough. No matter who it is in your life, your husband, your mother, your father, your brother, your sister. Exactly. No matter if it's a family member, you can't tell them to fuck off. That's right. In my own opinion. But again, where can people buy your book? So they can buy it on Amazon, of course, Barnes & Noble. There's also an ebook, and I did the audio book myself. So you get to hear this Brooklyn accent. And um, everywhere, pretty much books are sold. What's all your social media links and stuff? Sure. The Instagram is the real Dr. Nadine. And TikTok, which I say is the Wild West of social media, is Dr. Nay, N A E L M F T. How has the response been on all the social medias? The Good. people are ruthless as well. How do you deal with trolling? Shitty messages. Everybody gets them. Yeah. You know what? I just heart them. And they think they get confused and they don't know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> Going forward for the future, Nadine, what's your plans? What's your visions? Oh, my vision is just to be grateful that I get to wake up every single day and I'm still breathing and just on my mission just to educate women everywhere about trauma bonds and, you know, help as many women. I would say helping, you know, helping women one heart at a time. Yeah. You know, just try to reach their lo- reach their potential in life and in love. So I love my work. I love being of service. And my, you know, my grandson's coming in four weeks. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Just keep working on my mission to educate people. What's your greatest life lesson? Playing it safe is the most dangerous place to be. Don't play it safe. Take risks. What's the bit of motivation that you could give someone that's maybe stuck in a rut just now? Yeah, that it's okay to feel stuck. It's okay to don't judge yourself for feeling stuck. Don't beat yourself up. Just say, you know what? There, are, take little, little steps to make your life better. Change doesn't happen like one big overarching change, right? What can you take? What two steps can you take today to make your life better? What two steps can you take tomorrow? What two steps can you take the next day? And then all those steps end up leading to big change. Nadine, listen, thank you for coming on today. Giving you're me very time. welcome. I thoroughly enjoyed that. What you're doing is amazing. What you've overcome is amazing. The book's amazing. I'll leave the link in the description. Would you like to finish up on anything else? No, just thank you for having me. Yeah, anytime. Yeah, this Listen, was fun. Yeah, all the best. Wish you all the best for the future. Thank you. And, uh, yeah, good luck with it all. Thank God you. God bless.